could it be? We're so heavily minded that somehow we've been blinded to what he's calling us to do right here. Could it be that heaven's always planned it, that we leave here empty handed when this life disappears? But is it really living if my one ambition is simply hanging on till we all get out of here? I don't want to waste a breath, one heartbeat in this stress. I want to see his kingdom coming. I won't wish my life away. I want to live each day to give away what I've been given. I don't want to leave here with regret. I want to leave with nothing left. When I think of all that I've been given And what I've learned from living I know exactly what I need to do So I pray that God will give me chances To show how great His grace is By living out His truth If somehow I could choose it I'd be the one God uses to make a difference in what forever means to you. I don't want to waste a breath, one heartbeat in this chest. I want to see His kingdom come in. I won't wish my life away. I want to live each day to give away what I've been given. I don't want to leave here with regret I want to leave with nothing left I want to be a light And lend a hand Speak the truth to a dying man I don't want to waste a breath One heartbeat in this chest I want to see His kingdom come in. I won't wish my life away. I want to live each day to give away what I've been given. I don't want to leave you with regret. Thank you. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Hebrews, and let's stand together uh, for the reading of the Word of God, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, we're going to finish the book of 1 John sometime this year, and uh, I've enjoyed preaching from 1 John, but I felt the definite leading of the Lord to preach from the book of Hebrews tonight and to preach on the subject of prayer uh, for this first part of the year. I didn't want to just announce prayer. I didn't want to just schedule prayer meetings, but I felt the Lord wanted me to teach and preach on the subject of prayer because if you're like me, it's an area where you're always needing to grow. Uh, Prayer and soul winning are the two areas it seems Satan fights us often, and uh, and you get a start, and then you're, you're not as faithful as you maybe should be. And I hope tonight will be a help to us, especially as we enter in toward the week of awakening. And I'd like to read in Hebrews chapter 10 beginning in verse number 19 and reading down through verse number 23. I love the book of Hebrews. I read through the book again last week, and it's just an amazing book that uh, really exalts the subject of, of, obviously, the atonement of Christ, but the New Testament in His blood and all that is possible to us because of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. And I think you'll see tonight the connection between the gospel and prayer, because without the shedding of the blood, there's no prayer 
for us. And so let's read about this. Hebrews 10, 19 says this, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of prayer. And Lord, if any of us had the privilege of perhaps walking into some famous person's house or into the White House or something of this nature, most of us would take advantage of an opportunity like that. And yet, we have the privilege to go into your presence, and oftentimes we, we fail to do so as we should. So teach us tonight in this matter of prayer, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our text tonight begins with an amazing phrase, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in to the holiest. It is interesting to me that God is calling us not to come timidly or cowardly or beggardly in the sense of not being wanted. He says, I want you to come to me and I want you to come boldly to me. Prayer is an essential part of the Christian life. As much as the heart is an essential organ to the body, prayer brings life to the church. D.L. Moody said, I'd rather be able to pray than to be a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach, but he did teach them how to pray. Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not fit us for the greatest work. Prayer is the greatest work. And so tonight we learn about this great work of prayer, three facets of prayer that I want us to hear and apply in the week ahead of us. Firstly, I want you to note with me tonight the access that we have to prayer, our access in prayer. And the reason that we can come boldly to the Lord, the reason we can enter boldly into the holiest, like the high priest of the Old Testament, of course, is through the payment of Jesus Christ. It is through his payment, he says, come boldly, enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Here we see the connection between the blood of the gospel and the privilege of prayer. And you learn the longer you're saved that all of the privileges of the Christian life hinge back to the atoning work of Jesus Christ, including our ability to come and boldly pray. Revelation 1 and 5 tells us, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins with his blood. You see, as an unredeemed sinner, there was no way that I could come boldly into the presence of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But because of the blood that was shed, and because that blood washes my sin and yours away, we can come boldly to enter in to the throne of grace. We come through his payment. We have access to the Lord because he has paid for our sin. But we also come through his priestly ministry. One of the great abominations of religion is the abomination of the confessional booth of the Roman Catholic Church. It is heretical to have a confessional booth. It is heretical to pray and confess your sin to any man on this earth. It is a heresy that came forth out of tradition and not forth from the Scripture. And I say it is heretical because it puts a man in the place where only Jesus belongs. It is only Jesus that is worthy. It is only Jesus that can hear the prayers of all the human race and can uh, bring forgiveness for those prayers. And notice what it says in verse 29. It says, In having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. The Bible teaches that we are all believer priests. First Peter teaches that we, all of us, have the privilege of worshiping God through prayer. And that we do not need to go to another man to ask him to pray for us. We can go directly to the high priest, 
Jesus Christ, and we can bring our prayers to him. Jesus is the high priest. Hebrews chapter 4, if you'd turn back there for just a moment, and verse 14, you'll find these words. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Aren't you glad that we have a great high priest tonight? He's seated at the right hand of God, the Heavenly Father. And when we pray, he's making intercession for us. He's ever making intercession. And when we sometimes don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit of God is helping us with our prayer and with the groanings that cannot be uttered. God understands those. And God is hearing those through our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the high priest. And this is why we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not pray uh, to a uh, priest on this earth. We do not pray in a confessional booth. And I've seen people over the years in Roman Catholic countries who've climbed upstairs until their knees were bleeding, who've given money to idols, praying for something, and all the time not realizing that the idols and the human priests cannot answer their prayer, but the great high priest can answer our prayer. Is anybody here tonight desperate for God? Does anybody want to know Him in a more personal way? Does anybody have a great prayer request tonight and you must have the answer from only from God? Then I would remind you tonight that we have a great high priest that is waiting to hear from us this evening. He is our high priest. He is our mediator, the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and it is the God-man. It is Christ Jesus. It is the man, Christ Jesus. And so he is the go-between. There is none other. Listen, I can pray with you. I can pray for you, but my prayers will get up no higher than yours. You have the same high priest that I have, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so our access in prayer is the blood of Jesus Christ and the mediation of the work of the high priest, the Lord Jesus. What a gift prayer is. It was paid for with the blood of Christ. It is continued by the working mediation of Christ who hears our prayer and oh, he wants to hear from us. He wants this church to pray. He wants this pastor to pray. He wants to hear from us during these days. Our access in prayer is because of the blood and because of Christ. But notice secondly tonight, our approach in prayer our approach in prayer. Now we learn about this approach again in verse 19 we see the phrase having therefore brethren boldness. We see God calling us again to come with confidence. The word boldness speaks of freedom in speaking. He he says I don't want you to fear when you come to me. I want you to speak openly. By the way how many uh, understand he knows everything anyways. I get tickled. Sometimes, sometimes we'll even try to trick ourselves in praying. Say, now, Lord, if there's anything I've done, I pray that you'll forgive me. If there's anything you've done, he might know what it is. <laughs> sometimes we pray in generality. Sometimes we pray like we don't want to disappoint the Lord. The Lord knows everything, and he still says, come boldly. He says, I know what you've done. I know what's going on in your life. I know what your needs are. I want you to come freely to me. Turn back to Hebrews 4. Let's look at one more verse. Hebrews 4, 16, it tells us, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. How many of you are thankful it's a throne of grace? Right? You say, well, do you believe that God chastens his children? I do. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. But the throne of grace, the, the time of prayer, is not where that judgment is meted out. It is truly where you meet God in his grace and mercy and loving kindness. Let us therefore come boldly in the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God says, I want you to come in. I don't want you to be flipping about it. I, I don't want you to act uh, as though you're just you know, talking to some guy in the sense of not reverentially speaking to the Lord. But he said, I don't want you to have any fear. I want you to come right on in freely and speak to me. During all of these years here as pastor at Lancaster Baptist, I've always had normally my office, maybe a secretary or two outside, maybe, maybe a couple doors to come on into the office, and, and I've always appreciated trying to have order and set up appointments and, and all these different things, and I, I think uh, some days I receive many dozens of calls and so forth, and I appreciate patience and folks kind of helping me with the, the process of answering all the calls and emails and all of that. 
But through all of these years, I've had a simple policy, and this is it. Unless I am in some kind of a knockdown, drag out marriage counseling, or if I'm leading someone to the Lord, something like that, leave me alone. But otherwise, let the kids come in. That's what I've always said. Let my children come in. Uh, if, they, if they need to see dad, I want them to be able to come right on in. I want them to just come on in. And uh, if they need to call, in fact, for all these years, I've had a private line until lately with cell phones is not so much as necessary. But before the cell phones, I had, a, I had a phone. If it was my wife or children, just call right in. Just come. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I want you to call me if you need me. By the way, how many of you dads feel that same way about your family? I want my wife and children just to have instant access to me. If there's something going on, if there's an emergency, I want to know about it right away. Uh, if, it, if it's an emergency, like they got a C in algebra, or they need a snicker bar, big emergencies like this, I want them to come right on in. Why? Because I'm their father. I'm their grandfather. I want them to have access. Aren't you glad tonight that you have a Savior that loves you like that? He loves you so much more, but he says, look at, I want you to come in. I want you to come in boldly, come with confidence. But then also I want you to see our approach, secondly, is that we are to come with sincerity. When you pray this week, pray with sincerity. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now notice the phrase, true heart. God is not looking for pompous prayer. He's not looking for uh, memorized prayer. He just wants you to talk to him. He just wants you to come with a true heart. Now turn, if you would, in your Bible to 2 Chronicles. We've seen this verse before, but 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Let's turn there very quickly because I want you to see the heart of prayer. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. And this is something that God is looking for in his church. You say, well, man, things aren't going well, or I had this big problem, whatever happened. Sometimes it's because God's just trying to get us to just slow down and trust in him and humble ourselves. If we'll humble ourselves, and then it says, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal, the, heal their land. And you know this. Revival's not coming from Washington, D.C. It's not coming from Sacramento. It's not going to come uh, from a worldly church that, that not only doesn't have revival, they've long stopped having a midweek or a Sunday night or much of anything else. God is looking for people who are seriously seeking Him tonight. And revival is going to come from a church that's passionately seeking God. And the Bible says we must humble ourselves Pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. This is what a true heart of prayer is. Look at you're not going to live in known sin and know that you're not right with God and know that you're not right with your spouse and come to God and tell me that that's real prayer. That's not true hearted prayer. God is looking for people who are to mean business with him, to have a true heart, to have a pure conscience in our prayer. Look at verse 22 again. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Here we have the picture of the Old Testament priest who would uh, put on, before they would put on their priestly garments, they would wash their entire bodies. It was uh, necessary for hygiene, no doubt, but it was symbolic of the cleansing and the preparation and the attitude toward the things of God. And I believe we ought to have this attitude towards the things of God. And I know that I'm considered by some perhaps a little old-fashioned, but I believe when we come to church that, that we ought to approach the house of God with sincerity and cleanliness and orderliness. And, 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 and that's very important. I saw this morning a, uh, there was a ladder in a hallway the choir walks through, and I, I, I quickly made sure that some of those things were cleared away. Why? I I don't want the choir members seeing a ladder on their way in to worship God. You see, you say, well, that's just a little thing. But you know, those little things add up. But you can have the most orderly buildings and the most beautifully painted buildings, and you can have everything in order physically. And if your heart is cluttered, then it hinders prayer. So God says, when you come to me, make sure that you come with a sincere heart. Make sure that you're cleansed in the sense of having a sincerity with me confessing that sin. Psalm 66, 18. Would you open your Bible to that very quickly? Some of you have seen it before, but let's look at it again. What an appropriate verse 
before this revival meeting, Psalm 66, 18. It speaks to having a true heart and a pure conscience. Psalm 66, 18 says these words. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, I know, I, I hear what people say, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in Christ, I've been declared righteous, I'm under grace, therefore I can live however I want to live. You know, that's, that's a nice philosophy, but it's not a biblical truth. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What does it say? God forbid. And what does this verse say? Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, what does the rest of it say? Whoa. Now, how many of you would say, Pastor, I want the Lord to hear me? Amen. Sometimes people say, I don't feel like my prayers are going up above the ceiling. Have you confessed your sin before the Lord? How do we think that we can have bitterness or envy or any other type of sin in our heart, and then we can talk to God and expect to have close communion with God? We must come to God with confidence. We must come to God with sincerity. Let me say thirdly, we must come to God with faith. We must come to God with faith. Now look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now faith is the opposite of fear, is it not? And sometimes we'll have circumstances come into our life and you have that faith-fear battle. I have that from time to time. Perhaps you've had that. I know that God's in control. I know that God's got this whipped. I know that God has power over all of these things, but what if? Anybody else go there sometimes in your mind? And God says, when you pray, I don't want the what if in that prayer. I want you to come to me believing that I am a rewarder of those that diligently seek me. But I need something big. We have a big God, don't we? Thankful for that. Now, I'm going to preach a full message from this passage in, in the future, but turn, if you would, to Philippians 4, uh, Philippians 4, chapter 6, Philippians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, rather, a great passage of Scripture, and it's been such a help to me, and I hope it'll be a help to you tonight. Philippians 4, 6, and this is what it says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What I have found is that many times fear will cancel out faith, but guess what? Faith will cancel out fear too. And God wants us to come to Him with faith, believing in Him. You're in Hebrews chapter 10. Turn to chapter 11, and let's look at one more verse. Hebrews eleven six. Hebrews 11, 6. I know we're covering a lot of verses tonight. I looked outside, though, and I saw the sign. It said Baptist Church, so I figured it'd be all right to look at some verses tonight. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Notice what it says here. But without faith, it is impossible to what? And again, some people say, I don't have to try to please him. I've been justified. I'm under grace. Well, why does the Bible say you can please him? Apparently, faith pleases him. Apparently, it's possible to bring praise and adoration and to be pleasing to the Lord. I don't know about you, I want to be pleasing to my Lord. Without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now that's why we're emphasizing prayer this year. Maybe I'm emphasizing it for myself, but I hope that all of us will be the benefactors of it. I believe we need to more diligently seek the Lord this year in our personal lives at home, in our life as a church, diligently seeking God, seeking a transformational experience in the power and the presence of God. And I share with you this quote tonight that so blessed my life this week, and it's from E.M. Bounds. And anything you can read on prayer from E.M. Bounds is very beneficial. We have some things out in the bookstore tonight. And here's the quote, and you should write it down. Moreover, when faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. When faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. Something that we believe God for is something we're going to pray for. 
And I want to encourage you tonight, whatever that something is, put it on the top of your prayer list and believe God. And seek God in prayer and through faith. Our access is through the blood of Christ. Our approach is to come with confidence, to come with sincerity, and to come with faith. And to have a real conversation this week with the Lord. And then I want to close with this tonight, our activity in prayer. So we see the, the access is through Christ. The approach is an approach of sincerity and purity and faith. But let's notice tonight the activity of prayer. And here I want to come to a familiar uh, acronym that we've shared before. And I want you to jot this down if you're taking notes tonight. How do we pray? How do we pray? Let me give you something that we've taught before but I think is worthy of repeating tonight. First, when you come to the Lord, take some time in adoration. Think about the one you're talking to, to adore him for who he is, not for what he's going to give you, not for the things you're going to ask him, but to adore him for who he is. Luke 11, 2. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, Jesus said, when you start to talk to me, remember who I am, our father, which art in heaven hallowed be thy name. We recognize his position. We recognize his place in our lives. We recognize that he is our heavenly father, that we are the children. And we take time to just think about who God is, to adore his person, his attributes, to think of the fact that he's all-knowing, he's omnipresent. Whatever I'm going to pray about tonight, if it's somewhere else in the world, he's got it covered. If there's something that no one else can understand, he does. And I want to just stop at the very part, first part of prayer and be reminded of who God is and I want to adore him. The second letter in this acronym for the word ACTS is the word confession. Confession. And I believe sincere prayer involves confession or repentance before the Lord. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I have good friends and theologians who would say that this verse applies to the salvation prayer, and I'm not going to argue that point. I happen to believe that uh, turning to Christ in repentance is necessary for salvation, and I also happen to believe that having a repentant heart as a Christian is vital for fellowship. So I believe that confession is vital for fellowship, and I'm thankful that when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. You say, well, what if there's a sin that we commit and we never thought to confess it? Is it ever going to be forgiven? Thank God your sins are as far as the east is from the west, whether you remember that sin or not. I understand that. What is confession for then? If we're already forgiven, if we're under grace positionally, confession is for the purpose of having sweet fellowship with God, keeping a tenderness between you and the Lord. If you're a married man and you somehow slip up and get mad and just say something dumb about the meal or just dumb about something at home and, and, uh, and you can tell instantly that you have grieved your wife, you would be a smart married man to go to your wife and to confess your stupidity even if the children are there. Just get it out and confess your stupidity. All God's men said, and that's just the, the thing to do. And the Bible tells us that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 says we're not to quench the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's going to try to move this next week through the revival meeting. He's going to be moving. He's going to try to move into the, into the pews here and into the hearts and through this church and convict people who've been lackadaisical and unforgiving and people that have had this excuse and that excuse and holding maybe this sin or that sin or who knows what he wants to talk to us about, but I believe the Holy Spirit wants to talk. And the Bible says don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And so we must confess lest we grieve the, the, the Spirit of God. And so we begin with adoring God for who He is. And then secondly, we just pause. And we don't say, God, if I've done anything, if God brings something to your mind, confess that. And then receive His forgiveness and thank Him for it. Then the letter T. We have adoration, confession, and then we have this letter T, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is one of the most neglected aspects of prayer and sometimes of the Christian life. The Bible says in Colossians 4 to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. I've been doing a lot of reading at the beginning of this year and 
People talk about uh, how to get physically fit, and people talk about how to, how to have the right mindset for the new year. It's been interesting to me that several secular articles have talked about the importance of thanksgiving and being thankful. And even in the context of sleeping well, having a thankful heart. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can, I can lay down and my mind can be so full of so many things. And sometimes I can wake up in the middle of the night thinking about those things. Sometimes uh, to-do list number 21B, I didn't get that one done today. Anybody else like that? You have a busy mind like that? Do you know one of the best things you can do in your prayer time before you go to bed is just stop and just list out many things that God's done that are good and wonderful and blessed and be thankful for what God has done. Adore Him. Confess to Him. And then thank Him for what He's done. And I'll tell you what, when you start thanking God, if you're serious about it, you can go a long time thanking God for all the good things He's done. So we have adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then we come to prayer as we think of it. That is supplication, acts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Ephesians 6.18 says it this way. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So supplication is asking God. It's, it's coming to him and saying, God, I'm asking you for a closer walk with you. I'm asking you to bless this uh, uh, aspect of my life or business or family or health or whatever the need is. <laughs> bringing supplication before the Lord and asking, asking for others, uh, intercessory prayer, asking for your Sunday school class, asking for your bus children, whatever the case might be, bringing your request before the Lord. Now, sometimes over the years, as I've been trying to plan or figure things out, uh, Terry will be the one that will, will remind me sometimes about prayer. And she'll say, why don't, why don't we just pray about that? And how many of you husbands hate it when your wife is right? And uh, she, she has, uh, she's got the right direction, and you're trying to figure everything out, and she'll say, why don't we just pray about that? Years ago, probably 38 years ago, I wanted to go to a, a Bible conference, and some friends of mine were going, and I thought, boy, that would be great to go to the Bible conference, and, uh, but there was a cost involved in getting there, and, and uh, I just didn't think I could, and I think it was maybe about four or five days before the conference started, uh, Terry said, well, honey, why don't we just pray that God would provide a way? I mean, we were doing our best. I, I, I was an assistant pastor at the time. I think I was making $13,000 a year, and Terry was babysitting kids, trying to make a little extra money, and we were just trying to get through, and, and had no medical insurance, stuff like that. We were just, just really just going from meal to meal, and there was no way to go to something like a Bible conference and uh, pay for an airfare and so forth. And she said, why don't we just pray? And, uh, and I, I said, okay, honey, we'll, we'll pray. And for the next several nights, we just prayed together that God would provide a way, that if he wanted me to go, that he would provide that way. And I will never forget, the meeting started on a Monday, Saturday night, there was a man from probably 80 miles away who knocked on our door. And, uh, and he knocked on my door, and I had preached a soul-winning rally for their church, oh, some months before. And uh, I had gone up there and preached a 45-minute message and then drove back home. And, and I was just glad to get to go to preach. I mean, it was just a blessing to serve and hadn't thought a thing about it. Here's this man knocking on our door, 701 Clyde Avenue, Santa Clara, California. I opened the door. I said, hey, brother, what are you doing here? He said, Brother Chapel, you preached for us some time ago. And he said, the Lord brought to my mind today. I never even bothered to pay for your gas or give you an honorarium or just say thank you for coming to preach for us. And he said, I just, it's just been on my heart that I should just drive down here tonight and, uh, and I should give you this love offering and say thank you. And you know the story. It was the exact amount to attend the Bible conference. You know, time and time again, we've seen God do these things over and over again. We've seen God bless and do such wonderful things. I stand here today as a pastor. I'm human. I have the emotions you have. We're trying to finish this large building program in the midst of COVID. You know what the devil says? What are you trying to do right now, you big dummy? Why? Don't you know? I remember we were building this auditorium back in uh, 1999. And I remember because it was COVID, and I was thinking, do I need to drink water from my swimming pool? Not COVID, uh, Y2K. Do I need to save water from the swimming pool? Because Y2K is coming. How many remember those types of thoughts? I better buy some rations, all those things. Y2K was coming. And I remember opening up one morning. I was preaching in San Diego, California. I opened up USA Today, and this is what it said. 
Lancaster and Palmdale lead the nation in foreclosures. And I remember the devil jumping on my shoulder and saying, you're trying to build a $5 million auditorium in the midst of people having their homes foreclosed upon? The worst period in the, in the entire economy of all these many, many years and, and everyone's going through these hard times and you're trying to build this, this building right now in this period of time and the devil jumped. You know what? Many, many times I've had to say, devil, jump off my shoulder. I've had to get back on my knees and say, God, uh, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And Lord, I want to keep my eyes on you. By the way, we're sitting in the building right now tonight. Time and time again, we've seen God answer prayer. And we must come to the Lord in supplication and trusting that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So many times there are things in our world, in our life, they're so much bigger than us. So many things that we've faced in recent years, and yet we're seeing God slowly but surely show us the reason, show us the way of escape, show us how to endure. John Bunyan is one of the Baptists that I so re reflect upon and so respect. And Terry and I years ago visited Bedford, England, and we walked into the prison where he spent seven years because he would not take a license from the state to preach. Seven years in prison because he would not take a license from the state church to preach. And John Bunyan, while he was in that prison, wrote a book, some of you have heard of it, called The Pilgrim's Progress. The Pilgrim's Progress for many, many years, and maybe still today, was the most widely published book in the entire world other than the Bible, written by a man who in prison just kept believing God had a reason. John Bunyan said this, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. Pray often, for prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. Prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge of Satan. The great victories in this life are going to be prayer victories. And we must this week come to the Lord and say, Lord, we need the victories that only you can give. God, we're a desperate people. We're coming to a revival meeting. Many churches have given up on revival meetings. We're going to have the meeting, Lord. It doesn't mean we're any better than some other church, but we don't want to simply have a meeting. We want to meet with you. And this is what we're coming for. And so we adore you and we confess our need to you. We bring our thanks to you. We bring our supplications to you. Our access in prayer is the blood of Christ. Our approach in prayer is that we come sincerely with a pure and a confessed heart, that we come in faith believing. And then, of course, our activity in prayer. We adore, confess, give thanks, and bring supplications to the Lord. Tonight, we're going to have an altar call because a part of the message dealt with confession and sincerity. Before we're dismissed tonight, we're going to spend some time in prayer. But since the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, how many of you would agree with me, it's appropriate to have an altar call before we pray? And you don't need to come up here and tell me your sin. We've already covered that. I'm, I'm not the one. You tell it to the Lord. But folks, let's not wait until Wednesday night of the week of awakening to come and start repenting before the Lord. Let's begin that work now so that Brother Getch can enter into the prayers of the church so that he doesn't have to come with a sledgehammer trying to crack open this fallow ground, but that so we would say, Lord, would you work in my heart right now tonight? So let's stand together. And tonight, if you do not know the Lord as your Savior and you'd like to know what it means to be a Christian, we're going to invite you to come. But in a moment when I pray, church... I want to encourage you to come and let's start seeking the Lord and repenting. And if there's something on your heart and mind, something big, something you need God to do, if we're not going to pray now, when are we going to pray? Let the Lord's house be a house of prayer. Father, bless the time of prayer at this altar call as we privately confess to you and as we privately repent and as we seek your face and as we pray for revival. And may this time of prayer be the beginning. Lord, I made 59 announcements it felt like tonight, but none of it's as important as just having you. 
having your power and your presence. Lord, if there's iniquity in our hearts, help us to repent of it tonight. Thank you that you're there to meet us graciously. Help us tonight to experience you, not in some emotional way, but in a biblical way. And if there's emotions of joy or tears, whatever it is, Lord, that's of you, then, then you have your way. Lord, reveal the secret sins and remove the hidden fears. And God, let this be a week of prayer, a week where you are with us and we are with you in prayer. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother John singing, you're invited now to come and just take time with the Lord. The altars are open. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Let's take time in prayer. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Our Father in heaven, tonight we thank and praise you for loving us and we thank you for providing this time of prayer. And Lord, we would ask tonight that as we go throughout this week that we would constantly abide in prayer. Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in our midst next week, that there would be true repentance, that there would be salvations, that there would be times of cleansing, and that you would be pleased in our lives, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As you remain standing, we're going to sing two songs before we pray in just a moment. Brother John, if you'll come and lead us. I want to sing this chorus, Spirit of the Living God. Fall fresh on me, you sing together with me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me. that chorus again you ready spirit of the living god fall fresh on me spirit of the living god fall fresh on me melt me Be seated. I'm going to ask before we're dismissed tonight that we would have some of our adult Bible class teachers, maybe some of our deacons, 
uh, to lead us in prayer. And we're just going to take some time to pray uh, audibly and in the auditorium here. And uh, we'll ask some of these of our uh, church uh, servant leaders to uh, lead the time in prayer. And I'd, I'd ask uh, four or five, six of you uh, to pray, after which time I'll lead in prayer. Then we'll have one other season of prayer tonight before we're dismissed. We won't be extremely lengthy, but I don't want to just uh, rush through this. We've tried to emphasize it. Now we want to practice what we've been preaching and teaching and learning tonight. And so I want you to join with me with our heads bowed and eyes closed. And those of you that would pray, if you'd stand and, and uh, uh, pray aloud so that we might hear and participate with you in prayer. And uh, let's go ahead and seek God's face as we approach the revival, praying for the evangelists, praying for the church, praying for ourselves. Let us pray. Amen.
Amen. Father, we do adore you, and we take this time to praise you for your magnificence. Father, there are challenges that we see, we hear about, they are nothing for you. And so we bask in your glory, and we praise you for your strength. And we confess to you, Lord, our sin our fears, our, our longings for those things that do not matter for eternity. Lord, we pray that even throughout this week that you would just begin convicting us, showing us areas where we have not sought you. We confess to you, Lord, that many times we live on autopilot, just going through our own motions. And we do want to thank you for your mercy and grace during those times. We want to thank you for giving us the local church, the Bible, the, the wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit. And may we not neglect or take advantage of these gifts. And so we ask and we bring our supplications tonight for the week of awakening. We ask for members that are ill that you would heal them. We ask for some that are struggling about being in public places that you would show them your will. We ask that every member would be not only drawn closer to you, but, Father, that, the, that you would burn away the dross, that you would burn away anything that is unnecessary and purify our lives during this week. Lord, this last two years has been a time when uh, there have been so many things cumbered upon us, so many confusing topics and so many uh, seeming agendas but Lord this next week we want your agenda for our lives that's what matters and we invite you to come in power and to speak and so Lord we pray that you would work mightily in our lives we know that you must work in us before you work through us and we invite you to do so Thank you, Lord, for this time tonight to learn and to pray. Help us to be faithful in our meeting with you privately this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.